Turn in your Bibles, please, if you would, to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. John, chapter 12. I want to bring a message that I'm calling Good, Better, Best. Because some things in life are good. Other things in life are better than good, and still other things are best. So when you Think back to your school days and you got your report card. If you got a C on your report card, that's average, so we could say that's good. If you got a B, that's better. If you got an A, that's best. Coffee in the morning, that's pretty good. Add a cookie with the coffee, it's better yet. Add that experience to drinking that and eating your little cookie with your feet up. That's, that's the best. Uh, you might go home today and grill a hamburger in your backyard. That's good. But if you add cheese to it, some would say, well, that's better. But here in this state, if you add green chili to that mix, am I right? That's the best. In John chapter 12, I want to make three comparisons, three evaluations, three contrasts of one thing with another. One thing may be okay, it might be the norm, it might even be good, but there's clearly something when compared to that is the best. Today is Palm Sunday, that's what we call it, Palm Sunday. It is the beginning of Passion Week Uh, also known as Holy Week uh, in some Christian denominations. Holy Week, Passion Week is from Palm Sunday all the way through to Easter because Passion Week commemorates, brings to mind the final week of Jesus on this earth. The last six days, the last 140 plus hours of Jesus' earthly life as he made his way to the cross to give his life for the sins of the world. Today, Palm Sunday, and on Good Friday, and on Easter, we're going to confine our thoughts to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. We're going to be in this chapter for this week, and Good Friday, and Easter. And there's a little theme that you'll have noticed in our artwork and in our communication sort of a tripartite theme, on the ground, in the ground, from the ground. One is Palm Sunday, the other is Good Friday, the other is Easter. On the ground, they put their clothing and spread it on the ground, and they took palm branches out and leafy branches and commemorated that their king had come, on the ground. Then on Good Friday, Jesus We commemorate that he died and was placed in the ground, in a tomb. But then on Sunday, on Easter, he conquered death itself and rose from the ground. And that's what we're going to be looking at uh, this week. Uh, Something to make a note of about Passion Week. Passion Week, this final week that we're talking about of Jesus' life, takes up considerable space in the four Gospels. Matthew has devotes two-fifths of the entire book of Matthew was devoted to the last week of Jesus. Three-fifths of Mark, one-third of Luke, and get this, one-half of the Gospel of John is devoted to the last week of Jesus. Or look at it this way. In all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are only four chapters that speak of the first 30 years of Jesus' life. Only four chapters. There are 85 chapters that speak of the last three and a half years of his life. Of those 85 chapters, 29 of them are just about this Passion Week, the final week of Jesus. And it begins with this event. This event being the triumphal entry. This event being Jesus getting on a donkey and coming into the city of Jerusalem. 
This is a key event. Why is it a key event? Why do we say it's a key event? It's mentioned in all four Gospels. That's important because many of Jesus' events weren't recorded in all four Gospels. His birth wasn't recorded in all four Gospels. But then certain things were mentioned four times. Feeding of the 5,000, all four Gospels. Palm Sunday, all four Gospels. Crucifixion, all four Gospels. Resurrection, all four Gospels. Sometimes God repeats himself twice. Remember when Jesus said, verily, verily? Now that's old King James, but truly, truly. He repeats himself to say, listen up, y'all. This is important what I'm about to say. Verily, verily, I say to you. Then sometimes there's a threefold repetition. Holy, holy, holy. That's to say God is above all else separate, holy, distinct, the ultimate. But when God repeats himself four times, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it's something we should take heed to. Now, this, we believe, takes place on a Sunday. That's up to dispute. We call it Palm Sunday, though there is argument about the chronology of this. Some place the event on Saturday, Or Monday. It just sounds weird to say Palm Monday. But um, it could be Monday, could be Saturday, could be Sunday. I'm going to go with Sunday. More significant than which day of our week it falls on, most scholars believe this happened on the 10th of Nissan. Nissan, 2,000 years ago, was not your truck. 2,000 years ago, when Nissan was a month in the Jewish calendar, Nissan. And it's a very significant month because that's Passover month. But on the 10th day of Nissan, on this day in particular, that's when the families in Jerusalem or in Israel selected the lamb they would sacrifice in a few days on Passover. So it is highly significant that on the 10th of Nissan, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world comes into the city of Jerusalem. Now, uh, you have heard me preach, if you've come here for any length of time, on uh, passages like this in John 12, or in uh, Luke 19, or in Matthew 21, or in Mark 11. All those chapters cover this event. And I have gone through that prophetically. I've taken you through that calendar of uh, prophetic Uh, significance from the book of Daniel. I'm not going to do that this week, um, uh, uh, this day. I want to get a little more practical than that. Not that prophecy is not practical, but I want to show you these three principles I'm talking about. Good, better, best. Three discoveries for Palm Sunday. As we go through each of these three, what I'm going to ask you to do is, is evaluate your life, not your neighbor's life, not your wife's life, not your husband's life. No nudges here. Not like this is for him or her. No, this is for you. This is for us. So let's make a self-evaluation as we go through uh, these principles. First line of comparison is that Jesus is more appealing than religion. I discovered that to be true on a personal level. Jesus is much more appealing as a person than what religion had to offer me. So look in verse 12 of John chapter 12. John 12, 12. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Let's stop right there for a moment. There's a context in which this is happening. The context is a religious context. Let me explain that. These are religious people in a religious city. Jerusalem is the capital of Judaism. For a religious festival. It's all about keeping the feast. You probably know there were three feasts, three mandatory feasts. Did you know that? If you were an able-bodied Jew, three times a year you had to go to Jerusalem. 
You went there for Passover. You went there for Pentecost. You went there for the Feast of Tabernacles. But of all the feasts, Passover had the most people because the Passover was the focal point of their history. That celebrated the fact that they were once slaves in Egypt and they were delivered and God gave them a nation. The normal population of the city of Jerusalem was somewhere between 50,000 to 100,000 people on a normal day, but not on Passover. On Passover, the city swelled to at least, get this, 10 times that. It grew 10 times its normal population. So people were coming in from everywhere for religious reasons. But every year it was the same. Every year they traveled the same roads. Every year they saw the same people on those roads. Every day they sang the same songs on those roads. Every year they practiced the same rituals in Jerusalem said the same prayers, but the people were growing weary of that to an extent. History tells us, without me trying to cite it, I have done that before, but history tells us that there was an expectation that was rising in the hearts of the Jewish people that they wanted a change, and they anticipated a person would come, a deliverer would come, a Messiah would come, and that messianic fervor was at fever pitch at the time of Jesus. They wanted more than what their religion had to offer. They wanted more than endless rituals. They wanted more than prescribed prayers. They wanted more than anticipated ceremonies. They wanted more than the sacraments of Judaism. And so Jesus comes to town and uh, changes everything. All the focus now goes on to him. That's what people are anticipating, that he could bring change. I have a book at home uh, by Max Lucado, a great author, and uh, he has a little section called The Musings of a Shepherd. And he supposes a shepherd is uh, up on a little kind of a promontory, and he's looking at crowds of people coming into Jerusalem. And Lucado writes this. He sits on, a, on the slope, and he places a blade of grass in his mouth, this shepherd. He looks beyond the flocks at the road below. For over a week, a river of pilgrims has streamed through this valley, bustling down the road with animals and loaded carts. For days, he has watched them from his perch. He knew where they were going and why. They were going to Jerusalem. They were going to sacrifice lambs in the temple. The celebration strikes him as ironic. Streets jammed with people, marketplaces full of sounds of the bleeding of goats and the selling of birds. Endless, endless observances. Yet the people relish the festivities. They awaken early and retire late. They find strange fulfillment in the pageantry, but not him. He thinks, what kind of God would be appeased by the death of any animal? Oh, the shepherd's doubts are never voiced anywhere except on the hillside, but on this day, they shout. It isn't the slaughter of animals that disturbs him. It's the endlessness of it all. How many years has he seen people come and go? How many caravans? How many sacrifices? How many bloody carcasses? Lamb after lamb, Passover after Passover. He turns his head, looks again at the sky, and he thinks, will the blood of yet another lamb really matter? That's how people felt. Will the blood of another lamb really matter? I mean, I keep bringing a lamb every single year. So uh, here it goes again. Kill a lamb, shed its blood. Will the blood of another lamb really matter? Only the blood of one particular lamb will really matter. And that's the one coming in on that donkey that day. The lamb of God, as John the Baptist saw him, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
So that's how people felt. They wanted more. They wanted reality, not religion. I've always loved what John Wesley said. He goes, I want my religion like I like my tea. I want it hot. Don't you want that? Don't you want your religion hot? Don't you want it to be real, authentic, not some lukewarm, insipid, vapid, weekly, same old, same old, same old. We want reality. And so look at verse 12. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Now everything changes. Oh, oh, Jesus is coming to the feast? Well, that changes the feast. That changes the focus. They took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. You know why all this is happening? Because they see Jesus as hope. He's a breath of fresh air in the stagnant air of religion. And he was. He was. Back in Matthew 15, the Pharisees get all up in Jesus' face about the way the disciples eat their food. And, and they basically say, your disciples don't follow the tradition of the elders. They don't wash their hands the right way when they eat. Why, why is it that your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? And Jesus fired back and he said, why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Bam. Just nailed them. They're clinging to their little religious way. We've always done it this way. Enter Jesus. Jesus is more appealing than religion. Now, this crowd is so interested in Jesus being at this feast. Go down to verse 19. Let's just got a spoil alert here. Let's go down to the end of the paragraph. Verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. They understood what was happening. Jesus were so drawn to this man, and still are drawn to this man, by the way. Mark chapter 12 says, the common people heard him gladly. It's one of my favorite little verses. Here's Jesus on the religious scene, but the lowest of the low, the very common blue-collar folks got him, and they heard him gladly when he spoke. So Jesus comes to town, they take palm branches, they go out to meet him, verse 13, and they cry out, what's the first word in the text that they cry out? Hosanna. You know what that means? It means save us now. That's what it means. Save now. Deliver now. Do something now. Bring salvation now. Do for us what our religion has been unable to do all our lives. That's what it means. Save now, deliver now. Now, we get excited when they say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. But in a few days, those Hosannas are going to turn into crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. The same crowd, many of them, will be shouting for the death of this man. Because they're crying for deliverance now. The kind of deliverance they're looking for is not salvation from their sin, which is why Jesus came. They want deliverance from Rome. They want Jesus to be the political Messiah, to take over the world and make them second in command. So they cry out, Hosanna, because they are attracted to him. And by the way, even those who reject organized religion, and there are many people who do, at the same time will admit that Jesus Christ as a person is the most compelling person in history. And I have had many conversations with people who say, Jesus, yes, organized religion, no. Let me give you a couple examples. Napoleon Bonaparte said, I know men, and I'll tell you that Jesus is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself have founded great empires, but Jesus founded his empire upon love 
and to this very day millions would die for him. This great leader understood there's nobody in history like Jesus. Here's another example. H.G. Wells, you probably heard that name. He was a historian and an author, a British author. Uh, Herbert George Wells, he wrote a very famous story, War of the Worlds, which became a few movies, even in recent times. Uh, He said this, I am an historian. I am not a believer. But I must confess, as an historian, that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. And this is what is angering the Pharisees. Because all the people are attracted to him, not to their religion. I grew up in a religious home. I went to Mass every week. I kept all the little things that I was supposed to do. And uh, it was good, but it wasn't good enough. And it was certainly not the best. And what we have to offer is not religion. What we have to offer, what we always talk about, what we're always about is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, a personal relationship with God vastly different than a religious system. So... Jesus is more appealing than religion. And this paragraph spells it out. Second point of contrast, Scripture is more reliable than opinion. Look at verse 14. Then Jesus, when he found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written. Now it's a Scripture they're quoting. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. That's a rendering of Zechariah chapter 9. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Everybody has some opinion of Jesus. Everybody. Everybody's heard of him. Everybody has some idea And everybody has some opinion of Jesus. Some of those opinions are good. Others are better than good, but still not the best. People say, well, he was a good teacher. He was a noble example. He was a gracious healer. They have opinions about him. Some are good. Some are better. But they're not the best because they're not true. So you know what's better than an opinion? Truth. Truth is better than an opinion. So let me tell you why I'm bringing this up. In the gospel of John alone, just this little gospel, the fourth gospel, uh, there are many different opinions that are seen as to who this Jesus was. Let me give you a quick example. In John chapter 7, some said he's a prophet. In John chapter 9, They said, this man is not from God. In the same chapter, this man is a sinner. In the same chapter, some said he's a prophet. So you have the gamut as to different people's opinions. In John chapter 10, some said he has a demon and is crazy. He's nuts. He's mad. Same chapter, others said this is the Christ And then when they said that, the other people said, how can he be Christ? He's from Galilee. Question, were any of those opinions right? Not really. I mean, they they said he was a prophet. That's closer to the truth. They said he was Messiah, Christ. That's accurate, but he wasn't the kind of Christ they expected him to be. But... On the opposite side of all those opinions, you have the truth. Twice here, you'll notice that John is quoting Old Testament Scripture. Notice in verse 13, they say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They are quoting, they are quoting Psalm 
118, a messianic psalm. It's because some of the people in the crowd think this is that deliverer. And so they cried out, believing he is the fulfillment of that scripture. And then uh, the second one is in verse 15, when uh, that free rendering I mentioned is uttered. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. That's Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. So if you're ever wondering why did Jesus ride a donkey into Jerusalem, it's not because he liked donkey rides. And he heard that in Jerusalem, you know, for like a five shekels, you can get one. Or it wasn't because he says, you know, I'm really tired. I'm tired of walking. I've been walking everywhere. I'd just like to take a ride for a moment. The reason he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey on that day in this manner is to fulfill the scripture that was written about him in Psalm 118 and in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Kings rode donkeys in times of peace. They rode stallions in times of war. He is basically saying, I'm offering terms of peace as your king. What the scripture says about him, the opinions that people have about him. The scripture is more reliable than opinions. What scripture declares Jesus to be is more reliable than what anybody else thinks Jesus to be. God's truth is not subject to man's opinion. Your truth is not better than the truth. People always talk about, well, that's my truth. That's sort of the end thing to say. Well, you have your truth and I have my truth. Well, you know what? There's the truth. There's the objective reality of what is true, not what you feel to be true or what you identify as being the truth. There is the truth. The truth. And this is why, you got to understand this, this is why the Scripture frequently invites and encourages objective examination. Look at it objectively. Test it. Test it. One of these areas that you are to test it is the area of prophecy. So did you know that God uses prophecy as hard evidence that the Scripture is accurate, that His Word is accurate? It's like, here's Exhibit A. Exhibit A is I'm going to predict the future. Can any of your religions and gods do that? Isaiah 41, God says, present your case, set forth your arguments, bring in your idols to tell us what is going to happen. Tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Or, or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we may know you are God's. Can you imagine walking up to an idol and say, okay, come on, spit it out. What's going to happen in a year? Tell us the future. Can't do it, can you? Because you're fake. Jesus said basically the same thing. He said, prophecy, predicting the future, is a good reason for you to believe. John 14, 29. And now I have told you before it comes, so that when it does come to pass, you may believe. John 5, 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. See, Jesus has three basic credentials that sets him apart from every other belief system. Number one, his impact on history, as attested to by Napoleon and H.G. Wells and a number of other people. His impact on history, number one. Number two, his resurrection from the dead. He conquered death physically by resurrecting. And number three, fulfilled prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy. Most religious systems base their religious systems and their beliefs on the philosophies of their founders. Of the 25 books that claim to be scripture, Prophecy is absent in them, except for one book, this one. 
detailed over and over again prophecy, over 300 different predictions in the Old Testament about what the Messiah would be in the New Testament. Jesus fulfilled them. This is why we study the Bible all the time, every service, every time we get together, so that we can get a clearer picture of who Jesus is, because without this, we'd be sitting around giving each other our opinions And that would be the most boring service in the world. I don't want to hear my opinion or your opinion. I want to hear what God says is the truth. Because scripture is more reliable than opinion. So Jesus comes into Jerusalem fulfilling what the scripture said about him. And by the way, even though I've covered it in the past, just really quickly, what happened that day shows the accuracy and reliability of the scripture. In Luke's account of this Palm Sunday, Jesus looks at Jerusalem and he weeps over it. He says, if you would have only known in this your day the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, therefore your enemies will surround you, close you in on every side. Now one stone will be left upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. I am holding you accountable, Jerusalem, for knowing what this day is all about, and you, you're blind. You say, well, how could he do that? Because Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, said, let me give you a calendar, let me give you a countdown. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah comes will be 483 years The commandment was given to restore and build Jerusalem, March 14th, 445 B.C. If you count 483 years, or exactly 173,880 days from that commandment being given, March 14th, 445 B.C., you end up at April April 32 A.D., 10th of Nisan, the very day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now it all makes sense. You should have known this day. Because you didn't know the time of your visitation, therefore your city is going to be destroyed by the Romans. Now, real quickly, look at verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first, at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him. You see how important the Bible is? Hey, hey, Peter, go go grab a Bible. Let's look this up. And they read it in the scripture, and it all made sense to them now. To this day, I and I've been doing this a long time, I am amazed at the accuracy and reliability of the biblical text. I truly am. So scripture is more reliable than opinion. Well, Here's my opinion about who Jesus is. Don't care. I'll care when your opinion is as accurate as this book is. When your opinion is that good and that accurate, then you got something. Until then, let's get back to the book. Let's get back to the truth. So Jesus, more appealing than religion. Scripture, more reliable than opinion. Third, following is more important than observation. Following is more important than observation. I want to unpack that thought and we'll close. Let's take a closer look at our text. And when you do, you will notice something. You will notice that there's actually four separate groups that John identifies in this large crowd that is gathered. Four separate groups. And by the way, John does this a lot in the Gospel of John. He often will show you how different people respond and react to what is going on. So first subgroup, there are the disciples. They're mentioned in verse 16. Then it says, his disciples did not understand. So that's the first group, disciples. Who are disciples? Twelve dudes, twelve guys who followed him around for three and a half years. They they. Uh, were with him when he spoke things, when he did things. They watched him. They were close to him. Those are his disciples. I'll get back to them in a minute. Second subgroup were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, which happened in the previous chapter. 
Two miles away in Bethany, Jesus rose his friend Lazarus from the grave. There were people who saw that. Look at verse 17. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. So they're watching what's going on with Jesus on the donkey into Jerusalem. They bore witness. The third group are people who heard about Lazarus' resurrection from the second group. That's verse 19. Uh, Verse 18, for this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done these things. So you got disciples, you got people who were there when Lazarus said, I'm back. Uh, Third group, people who heard about Jesus doing that to Lazarus. And the fourth subgroup are the Pharisees. They're mentioned in verse 19. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Uh, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. I always chuckle at this, by the way. I chuckle at the fact that the Pharisees are realizing, hey, guys, we're losing control of this thing. We're losing control of the people in our religious system. And I laugh at this because their worst nightmare is coming true. Let me show you something. Go back to chapter 11 for just a moment, real, real quickly. Just flip a page. John 11, verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did believed in him. That's the resurrection of Lazarus. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. These are the tattletales. I oh mean, I don't know about this guy. Let's go tell the authorities about this. So they tell the Pharisees. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. That's their biggest fear. Fast forward to where we're at. Verse 19, John 12. Look, the world has gone after him. So you got four groups, disciples, people who saw Lazarus rise, people who heard about Lazarus rising, and the Pharisees. Four groups. Actually, though you have four groups, you really have only two categories. You have followers, and you have observers. Some admirers, but they're all observing, they're watching. Watching Jesus is good, Admiring Jesus is better. Following Jesus is best. Good, better, best. The best is to be a disciple. What does that mean? The word disciple, mathetes, means a learner. It means a student. It's a technical term for the followers of Jesus, the 12 apostles or disciples who became apostles. In the Jewish world, a disciple was somebody who sought out a rabbi, a teacher. And when they found a teacher they wanted to learn from, they followed him around, they watched what he did, and they were called, these disciples, to a lifetime of work and service. That's a disciple. It's somebody who's in it totally. That's a disciple. There's observers, there's disciples, followers. Jesus said, Matthew 16, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. It doesn't mean deny things for himself. Okay, it's Lent. I'm not going to chew gum. That's not what it means. It means you actually deny yourself. You take yourself off the throne. You quit living for you and you live for him. If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That means walk the same road that I walk, literally. So are you an observer? Do you just come to church and observe? You observe worship, you watch it, it goes, interesting, interesting, very interesting. I come here a lot and I find it very interesting. (laughs) Are you an admirer? Now, that's better. You're on a different level. You find it pleasing. It's a positive atmosphere, positive experience. Cute girls. I might meet one next week. It's all good. Or are you a follower? A follower is somebody who invites Jesus into their life, 
Not once, but every single day. Lord, I invite you to be the Lord of my life today. I invite you, I'm going to follow you today. Another way to look at it, are you a traveler or a tourist? Now, I'm borrowing that from a book by Mark Buchanan. He wrote a cute little book, a cool little book called Your Church is Too Safe. It's a great title, Your Church is Too Safe. And uh, he makes a distinction between the travelers and the tourists. And this is what he says in his book. He says, the word traveler literally means one who travails. Travailer. A traveler is one who travails. It actually means one who suffers, one who labors, one who will go to a country, immerse themselves in a culture, learn the language, the dress, take upon them the lifestyle, eat whatever is set before them, and is usually gone a long time. That's a traveler, a travailer. But then there's the tourist, and the word tourist literally means one who goes in circles. He says, these are people who pass through briefly, they sample the food, they buy souvenirs, then they go each night to their hotel room, and they come home with the pictures and the t-shirt. That's a tourist. Traveler, in it, totally. Tourist, not so much. A sample of it, and that's it. Are you a traveler, or are you a tourist? Are you an observer, or are you a follower? All these groups are watching what is going on. Only one group is really following this one. These disciples are, have been following him for three and a half years. He will die. He will rise from the dead. And they will follow him even when he ascends into heaven to their death. Almost all of them will die a martyr's death. They will follow all the way through. So, some love to study about Jesus read about him, everything short of actually following him. It's good to study about him. It's good to admire him. But there's things that are good, things that are better, and then things that are best. And let me, let me sum it all up by saying, if a good thing keeps you from the best thing, it becomes a bad thing. A good thing becomes a bad thing if it keeps you from the best thing. If it keeps you from the best thing, if you are hiding behind, I admire him, I'm mildly interested in him, but I want him over there not ruling my life, that's not the best choice. The best choice is to become a disciple, a follower, to invite him in and to invite him to take control. And that is, that is the message of Palm Sunday that I wanted to bring, good, better, best. Now let's pray together. Father, thank you for an opportunity to study your word, to get a clear picture of Jesus. Every time we do, we understand more about him, and we understand what our response uh, is to be to him and what we can do for him as the Holy Spirit motivates our lives. Lord, we've read about a great crowd of people, some who were following, some who were watching, some who were even angry at him while they were watching. But Jesus is far more compelling to these people than what their religion had to offer. And lives really do change when they encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray, Father, that some would encounter you here this morning. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. It may be that most of you are disciples of the Lord Jesus, really following him. It's been real for you. It's been authentic to you and for you. Every day is an adventure with him. Every day you walk in lockstep with what his spirit wants you to do. You invite him to be in control of your life. Awesome. But some of you might realize, you know, that's really not me. I am an observer and an admirer, but I have yet to be a follower. 
but I want that to change. And if that does describe you, if you want that to change, maybe you've never really had a point in your life where you said, I'm going to make a decision, I'm going to make a choice. And the choice is to say yes to Jesus in a very definite way, a decision to follow him as Lord and Savior. I want to give you that opportunity. Because the Bible says, as many as received him, he gave them the power, the ability to become children of God. So that's a choice that you can make. If you've never made that choice, I'm going to give you the opportunity. If you did make a choice like that, maybe years ago, but you have not been following him, you've been walking away from him, you know your life isn't what it should be, you need to come home to him, I want you too to feel the warmth of his embrace as he brings you home as his child, his son or his daughter. So if any of those describe you and you are willing today to surrender your life to Christ, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, mine will be open to acknowledge your hand. I want you to raise your hand up in the air as high as you can so I can see it. Just You're raising your hand, but you're saying, I'm going to do this. Pray for me. God bless you. Right up here in the front, a couple of you in the back, a couple of few of you in the back over here. Right up here in the front, on the right side. Awesome. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Just raise it up high. Raise it up. This is your day. This is your time. Right over here to my left. Thank you, Lord, for these. Strengthen them now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. This last song, I'm going to ask you who raised your hands to do something even bolder than raising your hands. Jesus called people publicly to follow him. And we believe that when people do this, it actually cements what decision they're making a little firmer. So as we, as we sing this final song, if you raise your hand, please uh, make your way to the aisle. Just say, excuse me, to the person next to you. Make your way to the aisle. Come stand right up here. When you all come, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to receive Christ as Savior. If you raise your hand, we are going to wait for you to come. Come right up to the front, and I'll pray for you. Come on now. Come on out. Come and stand here. God bless you. Glad you're here. Aww. God bless you. Awesome, you guys. So good, man. God bless you. Hey. Come right on up here. Come a little closer to me. Right up here. That's good. this never gets old to you who see this, who, who, uh, who, who are coming week by week. Best part of my week is the weekend. And the highlight of the weekend is to see people respond, whether they're saved people who respond to a teaching or people who say, I want to receive Christ like this. If you have come forward, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to pray this prayer out loud. I'd like you to say it out loud after me. Say it from your heart. It's not a formula. It's just talking to God. So say this, Lord, I give you my life. Lord, I give you my life. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I believe in Jesus, that he died on a cross, that he rose from the dead. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Help me to follow him as a disciple every day. In his name I pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.